Hello everyone, welcome to a very grey and indifferent day here in the north of England. After the success of my first little mini-series of the people at John Ashley, I've happily returned here to review another bunch of unusual and interesting cars. Now the first one is this, a 1994 Range Rover Vogue SE. Now this video I think is going to be lumped in with my little series that I've called Icons. And I truly believe that this car is an icon. The only other vehicles that are in the series so far are the Ford Model T and the VW Beetle. And although this car wasn't made in anywhere near the numbers that those cars were, I don't think you can argue the fact that the Range Rover really has changed the face of the car industry. It was in production for essentially a quarter of a century and it's instantly recognisable. These cars went all over the world and they seem to be one of those very few cars that are all things to all people. It started off life as a slightly more luxurious alternative to the original Land Rover. And the modern Range Rover is essentially the epitome of luxury. It's the default choice of people that just want a really classy car. Uh, the fact that they're often called Chelsea tractors is, um, well, no accident. You go into London and you will see these littering the streets, uh, many of which have never even seen a muddy field, but they are all still unbelievably capable off-roaders. This one is one of the very last of the classic Range Rovers, and when it was being made, the newer P38 was actually in production at the same time, which is a bit of an unusual setup. Uh, this one being a late one comes with what they call the soft dash, which I'll show you in a moment, and it's the 3.9 litre Rover V8, that venerable power plant that here produces about 180 horsepower and about 230 pound foot of torque. Not an awful lot for a very big car, but it was a pretty old car by the time that this particular one was made, and because of that, this was very well featured. You'll notice with all manufacturers that as cars get older, the default equipment gets more and more generous. This being a Vogue SE is very well specified and it has features such as Connolly leather, a nice opening sunroof, electric seats, a slightly fancier than normal stereo. This one's even got air suspension and it's got a four speed automatic gearbox too and all sorts of various things that you kind of think are pretty good. It's even got cruise control in it too, which granted wasn't particularly unusual for the time, but was still an optional extra that you wouldn't often find in cheaper cars. The exterior of a Range Rover, what can I say about it? Well, I can say that it's a steel chassis with aluminium panels and much like the original Land Rover and the later Defender, it is very flimsy indeed. In fact, this bonnet we've just had open for a few pictures and it wibbles around like this. And the uh, same thing with the tailgate. It's kind of hard to get it closed now because so many people have pushed the middle where the handle is that um, it's started to bow. So um, it's all very typical British car in many ways. And I have to confess something. I've never actually driven a proper Range Rover before. The only one that I've ever driven is a Range Rover Evoque. And let's be honest here, it's not a real Rangey, is it? Anyway, let's take a look inside. The interior is called Westminster Grey. It's not that bad, actually. I'm generally not a big fan of uh, lighter coloured interiors, but it does work. Uh, this is the aforementioned soft dash, which does look uh, considerably more modern than the one that it replaced. And this was essentially uh, a sort of thing that BMW donated to them. Uh, the switch gear in here is all uh, a little bit old fashioned, but that's fine. This is, after all, an old car. Electric seats is quite a nice thing to see. The sort of slightly odd and bit dodgy, cheap looking wood in the middle, less so the wood and the doors looks nice. And it is a strange thing in here. Now, here's one thing that I do want to address in this video. It's no great secret that I'm not a particularly small or slender person. And I often get people ask me if I can fit in a car. Okay, usually prefaced by the thing, I don't want to offend you, but well, no offence taken. I fit in a narrow bodied catering, which anyone that's tried to do that will tell you is an achievement. And actually I fit in there in, in quite good comfort. However, fitting in this thing isn't all that easy and not at all for the reason that you might think. You see, I can get in here and this is the seat in its lowest position. I cannot get this thing any lower. And I've got, if I sort of sit upright, my head, not just my hair, 
is touching the ceiling. Now, perhaps the sunroof has stolen a little bit of headroom, as is often the case, but if you're especially tall, I couldn't really recommend one of these to you. And although I haven't driven a Range Rover before, a proper one, I have driven a Defender before. And one thing about this car is very familiar to me from that experience. This is really narrow. In a nice big luxurious car, I want plenty of room to get my elbow rested on the door. But in this thing, I feel like I'm right cramped in here. It's almost like being in a Lotus again. As you'd expect, the view out is nice and commanding and you are incredibly high up in here. And it's all pretty decent and reminds me in many ways of my grandmother's old Jeep Grand Cherokee, only this is a, a sight more luxurious and waftier. Anyway, before we head out, I'll just show you the back because that is important and then we'll see what she drives like. This is the aforementioned tailgate, which as you can see has a nice big handle here, which is exactly what you would think you would use to both open and close it. You're half right anyway. It opens like so, and, and this is an iconic country view, isn't it? I mean, uh, I'll be honest here, a Range Rover is a car that has never really appealed to me, and the fact is that I don't have the dogs, the guns, or the bank balance for it to be a car that's designed for me anyway, so I'm sure the people at JLR really don't mind, or not JLR at the time of production, this was simply uh, Land Rover. When you try and close it, oh, look, it's half down, but it actually clips in here, so you kind of see what I mean? But this is an iconic thing, you see. Can you see, you can now imagine the Lord of the Manor or the Lady of the Manor pulling up to a nice country destination such as we are here at beautiful Roach Abbey, and they open the back, and the dogs leap out, followed by the uh, public school educated children. It's a wonderful sight, the picnic hamper in the back. Oh, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And you know, they have a nice, lovely day before they go back to their you know, small 50, 60 acre household. And this is the weird thing, right? From here, this looks like a nice, big, meaty, wide, chunky car. But it isn't that wide, or <laughs> it's certainly not on the inside. And this car also has a few uh, subtle modifications in respect of this car's world famous reputation for steadfast reliability this car's owner carries no fewer than four diagnostic computers with him at all times and because this car is equipped with the air suspension and frequently used as a towing vehicle for his race cars he has made the sensible decision to install down here four small points where you can manually inflate the four corners of the car that is if the airbags will still hold the pressure so if something does go a bit wrong with the system you can at least get yourself home generally though and to be fair to the car it has been pretty reliable for him a little bit of very light restoration to a couple of the points of the car has happened but this is in otherwise fairly original and very honest condition. Now they do see quite a few of these down at John Ashley and they can restore them if you so wish. As can be predicted, they suffer from rust. Electrics can sometimes go a bit awry and the more complicated models such as the Vogue SE have all sorts of gremlins that can befall them. But they do have all the stuff that's needed to diagnose them and they are a very old school car. So having old school mechanics to work on them is always a benefit. But enough from me outside the car, let's take it out for a drive. Now I of course enjoy a sports car as much as anyone, actually, maybe a little bit more than a lot of people. But when I do a review of a car like this, there's a few things that I really enjoy. Uh, first off, this is the kind of road that would potentially destroy some of my own vehicles, but it is in fact exactly the kind of thing for which this car was built. Now, it's not exactly a smooth ride over these cobbles, but I've driven it in a few other cars, and I can tell you that this is doing a pretty damn good job of traversing this awful, awful road surface. Now, one of the other nice things about this car's classic styling, which apparently was pretty much an accident. The people that were engineering the car for their test bed, they just put some pretty basic functional panels on top of the steel frame and thought, right, a designer will come and sort this later, and then, Everyone looked at it and thought, actually, that looks pretty decent. So they just tweaked it a little bit and left it largely as is. But the bonnet is so squared off, I can see exactly where the corners of the car are. And that is no doubt very helpful if you are going to go proper off-roading. 
And proper off-roading is probably one of the reasons that you don't really see very many of these around anymore. They were, for quite a while, absolutely dirt cheap. You can pick them up for a few hundred pounds. And, uh, well, people treated them basically like scrap cars. They just had a lot of fun with them and um, toyed around with them and then um, broke them. Now, reversing it and moving it around is not too bad. And this cabin is actually very light and airy, which is... Um, quite helpful because as pointed out it's not particularly spacious if you're being honest about it. Now this car being original still isn't perfect and one of the few problems it has is the uh, steering box needs reconditioning so it's got a little bit more play in it than it should have. However once it hooks up the steering's actually much much better than I would ever think it could be in a Range Rover. It's got a good weight to it, no there's not an awful lot of feedback as is again no sports car but it's really quite nice and direct. I'm very impressed. Of course, it is a very slow rack, which you'd want it to be in a proper off-road vehicle. And it has the same turning circle as the battleship Bismarck. But that is, again, no different from a Defender. The car makes a pleasing note, but it's not too raucous. Uh, the exhaust is also totally standard and the owner has resisted temptation to make it bark and shout. And in fairness, I completely agree with him on this one. I love a shouty exhaust note, but in this car it just wouldn't suit. If for no other reason than with the auto box, it would make some very strange and silly noises and of course it wouldn't be any faster. It would just be more obnoxious than need be. And believe it or not, an old Range Rover these days is nearly about understated refinement. There's a few creaks and squeaks and things in here, but you can tell that they are just pieces of interior trim that need a, a little bit of massaging or perhaps a helpful dab of Vaseline to quieten them down. The ride from the air suspension is actually surprisingly good. Now, I can't say that this is ever a car that I would buy, but I do kind of get the appeal. It does actually feel reasonably solid from in here, which is what makes it all the more surprising when you go to move the body panels around and you find out just how flimsy they really are. The Vogue SE had this four-speed auto box as standard. The other cars had a five-speed manual and the auto box was an option. You could have the five-speed manual if you had a Vogue SE, but it was a no-cost item. You didn't get any money back for it, and I suspect most people would just leave the auto box on there. Now the problem with that four speed box having so few ratios to choose from is the fact that at certain road speeds the car will be revving unnecessarily high and that will no doubt contribute to this car's woeful fuel economy. But then you were never going to buy an old Range Rover to save the planet were you? I guess the newer cars with their big 5 litre supercharged engines are perhaps more palatable. They still drink like a fish but at least they move like a dolphin. Even if you jam your foot against the floorboards, you're never going to get anywhere near the sort of thrust that you'd expect from a big old powerful car, because it isn't a big old powerful car, it's, it's just a big one. But the engine is actually quite refined and I think suits this car very well. A diesel was available, though it's worth noting that it only came about about halfway through the car's life. It was only in the mid-80s that the diesel ever happened. They tried making diesel versions of the petrol V8, and if you ask the Americans, whenever you try and make that happen, it always ends very badly. In truth, the more that I drive this, the more I kind of like it. I drove it to the filming location earlier and I really wasn't enjoying it at all. Uh, partly because I was still getting used to the seat adjustment and I was very cramped in the car, but now I've lowered it as far down as it'll go, it's not too bad. I'd still strongly advise anybody exceptionally tall to check they fit before thinking about buying one of these though. Now these are a rare sight and it's quite a simple reason really. These suffer from almost the perfect storm for classic car rarity. They were expensive to buy in the first place, they are still very expensive to maintain, they are very expensive to run even if things don't break, and they will break, they rust, and people bought them when they were dirt cheap and beat the living daylights out of them. So if you do find one to buy, there's a very good chance it might be hiding an awful lot of things. And 
those are the simple reasons that neither these nor the P-38s are a very common sight anymore. I remember about 10 years ago, you saw P-38s all the time. They're a very fun, popular car for people to buy if they wanted some budget luxury, but now, sadly, they are no more. If you want a super luxurious car on the cheap, I would personally recommend something more like a BMW 7 Series. There is actually a bit of a familial connection between the 7 Series and the P38, although um, uh, BMW's involvement with Rover by that time was done. Truthfully, this Range Rover is going to go firmly in that category of cars that I don't really like, but I get it, I respect it, I see why it was so popular, I wish that only farmers and landed gentry kept buying them and I hate the fact that they have now become a symbol for sort of urban excess and I think it is something of a tragedy because to this day they are still an extremely capable off-road vehicle but I can't really blame Land Rover for that they simply made a vehicle that people wanted to buy and that is why to me the Range Rover really is an icon and if any car is possibly responsible for the modern trend in vehicles well if you trace back all these crossovers and things people are buying now this is probably where it all started damn you land rover anyway hope you've enjoyed this brief little look at an iconic car i'd love your suggestions as to what you think i should cover next what other vehicles have been as legendary and as important as this one thanks all for watching Please comment below, hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already because it does make a big difference to me and the channel. And we'll see you for the next one because I've got something really cool coming up. Bye-bye.